this series uh, has been a pleasure for uh, me, for um, my colleagues, and uh, largely because of the, the friendship exhibited and also because of the why audiences yourselves who become part of this evening and make them enjoyable for us as we hope to uh, for, uh, for you. We have had so far two of these, ev these evenings. This is the third. The first, we talked about journalism with Jim Lehrer and John Leo and Jane Pauley. Um, we talked about the movies with Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward and Sidney Lumet recently. And tonight, three wonderful guests, Gwen Eiffel, Mario Cuomo, and Tom Brokaw will talk about politics. Um, Helen Thomas will not be here uh, tonight, I'm sorry uh, to say, but I'm quite delighted to say that Gwen Eiffel will uh, take her place and, um, and I felt exactly the same way. Um, after the new year, uh, Susan mentioned a, a night that we'll have with historians, author Schlesinger. Um, talk about history with Arthur Schlesinger and Bill Sapphire and Michael Beschloss. We will talk about social progress with Skip Gates, uh, Katie Couric, Bill Buckley. Um, the, uh, uh, talk about the city with Ed Koch and Beverly Sills. and It just goes on and on. And so it's a, it's a very nice group of people meeting a very nice group of people. Uh, tonight we talk about politics. Uh, everybody talks about politics. It is something in our bloodstream, something we do naturally, at least Americans do naturally, comfortably, wildly, without any restraint. The, it is the, um, the only subject I know that seems to have no limits. People always set certain points of tact when they talk about religion. They said almost uh, uh, as, uh, as uh, firm a line when they talk about sex, although that's loosening as the years go on. But when they talk about politics, there are no limits. Everybody feels he and she knows about it and can talk about it and be expert about it and know how things are to be run. And the very talking about politics must have something to do with the way the country is constructed. I myself have a tenuous con connection with politics. I've written about a few politicians. What I like most is the way politicians talk. And uh, I miss uh, some of that, fortunately. Tonight we have one of the great eloquent speakers. But there have been others. I really miss George Bush. <laughs> the elder, I mean. I, the the uh, um, things said then that you only can retrieve through memory. When he was, when he was praising, I think he was praising Václav Havel, then president of Czechoslovakia, he praised Havel for, quote, living or dying, whatever, for freedom. <laughs> of the 1988 election, he declared that the undecideds could go one way or the other. <laughs> Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan uh, was better, um, said more wonderful things. People forget that. Returning from a trip to Latin America, Reagan informed us, you'd be surprised. They're all individual countries. <laughs> sure, sure, we made mistakes, he said. But don't throw the baby out with the dishes. Actually, the funniest thing said in connection with Reagan was not said by Reagan, but in his presence. He was giving a speech at a white tie dinner of the Knights of Malta, a very conservative Catholic organization, very high toned. And he was being introduced by J. Peter Grace, and he was going to speak about laws about abortion. So Grace began his introduction of Reagan. Ronald Reagan knows where life begins. Ronald Reagan knows that everyone in the world, every one of you, was at one time a feces. <laughs> poor, poor Grace repeated feces three times during the <laughs> inter... Well, who is to say he was wrong? 
We have three remarkable people who are about to come out on stage, and let's talk politics with Gwen Ifill, Tom Brokaw, and Mario Cuomo. brief, probably unnecessary, undoubtedly unnecessary introduction of each. Gwen Eiffel has just joined the news hour with Jim Lehrer, has just graced it. She came uh, from NBC and brought those skills uh, to the news hour of clarity, of good sense, of being able to get something worthwhile out of anybody with whom she uh, speaks. Um, wrote for the New York Times before uh, uh, that. Um, and is the new moderator of Washington Week in Review. So she's doing a lot. And I only have one small concern about Gwen, that she's raising the level of excitement of the news hour, <laughs> and we like to keep it... <laughs> at a more controlled <laughs> level. But a pleasure to introduce Gwen Ifill. Tom Brokaw, familiar to all of you as anchor, editor of the Nightly News at NBC, great reporter, won Emmy, won Peabody, and many other awards, was the first to have an interview with Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, the first to um, the first reporter on the scene of the Oklahoma City bombings was the only anchor at the toppling of the Berlin Wall. He is, as most of you know, uh, a deliriously successful author with this wonderful book, um, The Greatest Generation, and a new book, uh, which is just out, called The Greatest Generation Speaks. And Tom promises me that there will be no greatest generation goes Calypso. <laughs> but the, the, uh, he, shows him, <laughs> he shows himself in this too to be a first-rate writer as well as a first-rate reporter. And he and his wife, Meredith, do wonderful things in this city and for the city and for the country. A great pleasure to introduce Tom Brokaw. Mario Cuomo, the 52nd governor of the state of New York, did so much as governor, it, it's worth remembering all that he did for uh, children in this uh, state, all that he did for the mentally ill, for victims of AIDS, all that he did to provide jobs, um, as truly a great governor and leader uh, of our state. He is, too, an author, a successful uh, author of two wonderful books. Um, the one of them uh, was, what was the one about, what was this collection of speeches on words, uh, the title? More than, <clears throat> more than Words. More Than Words. And um, More Than Words was right because we remember when we just look at Governor Cuomo at the only truly eloquent politician of our times, the greatest speaker of our times. And I urge you, if you have not um, uh, recently, to read his Notre Dame speech, which is a, um, a classic in American uh, oratory. Um, it reads well, and to hear it was just, um, uh, was just uh, the best kind of thoughtful music. I like Mario because he is a dirty basketball player, <laughs> and that's the only kind of player you can be at our age. And, uh, <laughs> I particularly like him because 10 years ago, before I had an operation that was supposed to cure this miserable back, he gave me a board, uh, an actual official governor's sitting board, um, which I would, uh, I've had on my chair for all those 10 years, uh, sitting on that board and feeling great. And every time I think of Mario, I think of that area of my body. <laughs> an honor and a pleasure to introduce the governor of New York, Mario Cuomo.
And the first thing I will ask of all three of you is we ask uh, uh, of the others on other subjects too, uh, starting with Gwen, how did you get interested in politics as a subject? You covered politics uh, and continue to do so. How did you get interested in it and why and what, what sustains your interest? That's an excellent question, actually. I started writing at newspapers as a food writer, actually, which seems like a big distance from politics, except it gave me a chance to write. But soon enough, at the Boston Herald American, they gave me a chance to cover politics, which in this case, in the 70s in Boston, was the Boston School Committee, with Dapper O'Neill and Louise Day Hicks and all the people who basically thought people like me shouldn't go to school with people like them. And I saw politics close up because they fired the school superintendent one day right in front of my eyes, and I had no idea what they had just done until I got back to the office and realized I had the lead story in the next day's newspaper, but they had not witnessed it with my own eyes. So I learned that lots of things are said and done which are not apparent at the time. Things, I've learned to listen to the way politicians speak and the way that they, what they mean, which are not always the same thing, in fact, almost never the same thing, <laughs> and to try to find a way to interpret it. I actually like politicians. That's one of the things that actually I find that cuts me off the most from my audience. I, <laughs> I really enjoy the way that politicians think and the way they practice because, in my experience, the bulk of the folks I've covered are honorable people who really want to be in politics to do something good. And the scoundrels are the ones who make the great stories. So we sit there and we try to balance out these two things. What we don't do as good a job of, of course, is explaining how the people who are there to do the right thing do it, if it gets done and when it gets done. But that's, that's why I like politicians, and that's why I like politics. That's great. Tom? Well, my, uh, one of my earliest memories, I was eight years old, uh, and there was great despair in our household. We lived out in the working class communities on the prairie of South Dakota, and there was great fear that uh, the saintly Harry Truman would lose to this evil New Yorker, Thomas Dewey. <laughs> and my parents, uh, who had had their lives saved, in effect, by Franklin Roosevelt, and then trusted Harry Truman to do the right thing, uh, in our little community were working very hard uh, to influence their friends and talked about it almost every night. And my mother woke me early the morning after the election to start pummeling me and saying, we've won. And she then told me the story about Alvin Barkley being awakened by his grandson saying the same thing. Grandpa, we won. It is a vivid memory for me about how politics really is a message that goes all the way across this country. In those times, it was all by radio, but there we were in this distant corner, and yet we felt so connected to what was happening at the national level. And so almost from that moment on, I was interested in the politics of my community, my state, the region, the country. And as I evolved as a young man, my interests were in majoring in political science. And although I had no real journalistic models immediately around me, in 1960, that memorable election year when I was just a sophomore in college and saw all of that played out on television, I thought, that's an occupation that I think I could be happy in. And so I began then to try to steer myself toward the kind of work that I'm now able to do today. As I've often said, I overwished because I didn't ever think I'd get this far. I would have been happy just getting a really good job in Minneapolis, but they wouldn't have me, so I had to go on to the networks. <laughs> I have believed passionately that uh, politics reflect who we are at any given time in our lives. I have never found any political story uninteresting. I live part of my summers in Montana, and we have spirited city council and environmental and planning, planning and management meetings in the communities of Big Timber and Livingston. I find those just as fascinating as I do when I sit at home like a C-SPAN wonk and watch some debate that's going on on television that night or go off as I will tomorrow to cover the Iowa caucuses and the debate tomorrow night. So that's how it began. It's the reason I got into this business. Great. Governor? The, uh, <clears throat> I, I dislike the question because I'm afraid <clears throat> my answer is going to sound a little too serious. I actually despised politics. There was nothing in my youth, <clears throat> there was nothing in my youth that uh, suggested I should have any interest in politics. I was born in South Jamaica. Uh, in the middle of the Depression. Uh, we never saw a politician. Uh, no politician ever came to South Jamaica. There was no point in it. My mother and father were um, illiterate. Uh, they weren't educated uh, there or here. Um, 
They were thanks to a gentleman by the name of Kessler who took them in, put them behind a grocery store in South Jamaica. My father was a failed ditch digger in Jersey City and uh, about to go under with no workers' compensation or unemployment insurance or welfare or anything else. It was brought over to Queens, lived in the back of the grocery store. Mr. Kessler used him to do the physical work because Kessler had had a heart attack and couldn't run the grocery store, and that's the way I grew up. And um, went to PS50 and then Shima Junior High School um, and began to wonder why South Jamaica should be such a disastrous place. Um, got lucky one way or another, fell into the hands of the Vincentian fathers who gave me scholarships to high school and college and law school, graduate, met Matilda, got married, was on my way to having um, a wonderful family, five children, <clears throat> and was caught up with uh, survival, putting bread on the table and all those things, despised the politicians because the more I reflected on them, the more I wondered what they were doing about places that really needed them, like South Jamaica. And then by accident, I got involved in a series of cases, one against Robert Moses, involving the junkyards at Willits Point, which is still there. He wanted to take them for the World's Fair. And they came to me and said there was no place else they could be junk men in the city of New York. And if he took them for the World's Fair, they'd be out of work. A lot of them were veterans of the Second World War, as my brother was. I represented them. We beat Moses. I think it's the only time he ever lost in court. And then uh, that was followed by the Corona homeowners. Corona homeowners were 100 people fighting for their houses against Lindsay and Sam Lefrak, who was trying to wipe them out. And uh, same situation. They were kind of ignorant of the law. They knew nothing about politicians. They reminded me very much of the people of South Jamaica. And here was the system about to wipe them out casually. They had been here, one family, for 90 years. They wanted to build a playing field in the place where they had their houses. But we went to, to court 28 times in six years and we won the corona case. And then Forest Hills followed. And Forest Hills was an ugly, ugly moment in New York history with the Black Panthers on one side of the street and the Jewish Defense League on the other, threatening one another, semi-automatic weapons over a housing project that was clumsily uh, scheduled to be placed in the middle of a stable middle-class community. It was too large, it didn't fit. And the mayor asked me to, to do that, and I did it. And we, we mediated it and we got that resolved. And now I, begin to, I began to feel, number one, more upset about politics than ever, because I saw it up close, I saw its failures. And always it, it failed the people who needed it most, the people who were in the most trouble. Uh, at about the same time, I had been in the Catholic Jewish Relations Committee after the Second Vatican Council, when uh, the Catholic Church made an effort to apologize to the Jewish people, did it very badly. I was appointed the lay person to the Catholic Jewish Relations Committee, traveled around to synagogues with Rabbi Israel Mauschewitz and a team talking. And finally, now my children are growing up. I'd made some money as a lawyer. Not a lot, but we were okay. And I looked at all these problems and said to Matilda, gee, you know, maybe we ought to try going into government because the government seems to be failing in so many different ways. There were so many problems here that should be resolved because they're, they're, they're not difficult to resolve if only you're reasonable. And she said, well, you hate politics. I said, I do, but let's, let's make an effort. We'll go in for two years. And I stayed for 20. Um, because, <clears throat> just, just to put a cap on it, all through your life you look for some significance. And, and what happens to most of us, I think, is we get so taken up with the fight for survival that you don't get to the big philosophical question. Or, or you do, and you don't find a ready answer. You don't find it in the books. And you don't find any hero who's going to uh, reveal it to you. And, and so you give up on it. And, and you fill out the last part of your life, you know, trying to satisfy your appetites until they wither or your energy fails and you can't shovel any more goodies into your basket and you die. Um, but. But for some of us, for some of us, you, you think you find an answer. You think, you, 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 you think by looking, you know, you find an answer, and it shocks you with its simplicity. And I thought I found one. I had been an altar boy. I had been a Shabbos boy. I knew Mr. Kessler. <laughs> he had, and I found it in the, in the Old Testament. And I found it with the Jews, you know, tikkun olam and tzedakah, those two ideas. We're all brothers and sisters, and you're supposed to work together to repair the universe. Then I noticed that the Christians borrowed the whole thing, and made it the, you know, the rabbi started our church, right? And uh, took those ideas and, and uh, made a 15-second commercial out of it. What's the whole law? Love one another as you love yourself for the love of me, for I am truth. 
and the truth is God made the world but didn't finish it, your job is to complete the work of creation. That's tikkun olam. I told you I was a Jew. You say. <laughs> and, and, and I said, well, that, now this makes sense. And, and if you're going to do that, where do you do it? Well, you can do it in your own life. You can certainly do it the way you people have all done it and done it so magnificently, or you can do it in politics. And that's what politics should be. I went into politics thinking that. I've never changed my mind. It is the place to do it. And, to, and you can do it very, very well. And the people who are good politicians are doing exactly that. They're repairing the universe, making it a better place. And frankly, I'm sorry I'm not in politics now. That's interesting. It's probably just as well. Clearly, you've lost your speaking ability in the end. <laughs> I'm, what? I'm not going to respond I all night because, <laughs> because I know you have that bad yeah, back. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Among you, what is the greatest change that you've seen in your observation of politics in the last 20, 30 years, um, good and bad? I think the greatest change that I've seen is the, um, is the absence of any determination to find common ground, that it's more fractured and polarized now than any time in my memory at almost every level. Um, and I think there are a variety of reasons for it. Um, some of them are simply mechanical. That is that we have turned the political process, the business of getting elected over to hired hitmen who are mercenaries. They come in from the outside. They have lots of skills and they're fueled by carloads of money. And their only objective is to get their candidate elected and to destroy as much as possible the candidate across the way. And then that carries forward into, in this case, into Washington, where we have now this deep, bitter division and almost no uh, effort on the part of either party to try to, at the end of the day, retire to the cloakroom and say, hey, how do we solve this problem? How do we work this out. Um, I have talked with uh, Republicans and Democrats alike who served in the 50s and the 60s when there were deep divisions about what the, what the objectives ought to be, but they always were able to find some fashion in which they could get together and try to work it out without so dividing the country that we couldn't get anything at all done. So I think that the mean-spiritedness of it at all and the kind of uh, professional hitmen that have entered the political arena and have no ideological or moral baggage that they bring with them in many instances have really altered it and to, uh, I think, a detrimental effect. I guess two things. One is when I, when I first started thinking about covering a, my a national presidential campaign, especially, I thought about Teddy White and I thought about, you know, having these long rolling conversations with presidential candidates and they tell me all the secrets of their lives. Now we're at the point where we know too much about some of them. And it isn't, and it, what you know isn't authentic anymore. So I feel that that's changed a lot. What I got into the business to cover and the way I got into cover it, you don't do it that way anymore. The, the other thing that's changed for me is that as a, as a reporter in Washington and I, between the Washington Post and New York Times and NBC and now at PBS, I've been in Washington covering politics for 15 years trying to explain to people why it matters to them. And it gets harder and harder every year. The biggest change, and I think it follows a little bit of, about what, on, what Tom, the point Tom made, which is the cynicism which exists not only in Washington, but also out in the great beyond. This idea that nothing that anybody in Washington does could possibly matter, so why pay attention? And it's my job all the time to explain to them why it does matter, and I can't always do it effectively, because sometimes it doesn't. So that's, that, to me, is the biggest change. It's the lack of interest and focus and connection that folks have to what's happening with government, with politics, and why it matters in their lives. You've seen the same things? The, uh, <clears throat> I, I, I think so. I think the biggest change uh, for me, the biggest disappointment for me is, is that we, we have not reached the point where um, our leaders can say to America, look, this is the objective. Here's what we're trying to do with government. Here is what government's purpose is, and I'm going to give you a prescription that we can all agree to. Forget this uh, talk of labels, conservative, liberal. I'm going to give you a simple idea, 
And, and it gets back to the, the terribly serious idea that I described before. We believe that we're all in this thing together and that we have to create some kind of synergism to make this place as good as it can possibly be. That means as strong as it can be, as rich as it can be, as generous as it can be. You know what good means. It means being more just, being fair. Now, that is the objective. Uh, and the basic rule is you've got to come together to do it. Our whole experience teaches us that. That's why you had the Articles of Confederation. That's why we had the Constitution. That's why we have the World Bank. That's why you went to Europe after the Holocaust and brought them back to life, because we needed them. We needed Europe. It's why you went to Japan after the 1941 and brought them back to life, because you needed them. It's why you're in Russia trying to bring them back to life after the Cold War, because we're interconnected, interdependent. That's the whole game, all right? Now, as to the role of government and whether it should be big or little, that's a stupid, naive question, stupid at worst. Uh, it's not big or little government. You should have all the government you need, but only the government you need. And we'll decide that an issue at a time. Do you need it for education? Do you need it for housing? Okay, but forget all this other general. That's my disappointment. It seems to me the formula is so simple. And, and it seems to elude us, and I don't know why. Number two, the change. The biggest change is technological. Uh, you said last 20 years. You make it 30 or 40, and it gets to be easier. Because now you're not communicating in writing. Now it's not the newspapers where you can tell a full story. Uh, it's not even radio and newspapers. And th they introduced television over this period. That changed a lot of things. Because now you got down to 28-second messages. And that made it all harder to deliver this message. And now even more extreme, the internet. The internet is going to change things dramatically. It has changed them somewhat already. You're going to go from television to the internet in your advertising. That makes the advertising much, much cheaper. And that helps a little bit with the biggest problem uh, we have mechanically with politics, and that's the influence of money. There is no doubt that the election I won in 1982 against Ed Koch, he spent four million, I spent a million, Lou Lerman, he spent 13, we spent four. You could never do that again. You could not do that today. They beat you with the money. They almost did then, and now absolutely they do. That's the biggest change. McCain's right, Bradley's right, Gingrich was right when he shook hands with Clinton and saying we have to do something about it. They're all right when they say we have to do something about it. They're all wrong for not really wanting to do anything about it. What Gwen, what Gwen said about the probing of private lives of candidates, which we have uh, uh, seen um, in what must have uh, occurred to us to be the extreme in the president's case, but in all uh, cases uh, now, how legitimate is it? I mean, how uh, you, you, uh, one talks about abhorring the, uh, the scatological um, uh, snoopings of reporters, on the other hand, uh, politicians are supposed to lead open lives. Um, what's the fair line to draw, um, both from the perspective of the journalist and the politician, in what the public ought to know about the private lives of candidates? I, I'm always reminded, Roger, of uh, when you t start talking about drawing lines, there was that wonderful moment in a film called Broadcast News, uh, which I don't recommend to you as a training film for <laughs> understanding how we work. Uh, but. There were some uh, telling, I think, and truthful moments in it. And at one point, Holly Hunter is saying to William Hurt, who is playing the part of the kind of fall reporter uh, who has faked his crying on a separate camera, she said, you crossed the line. And he looked at her and he said, they keep moving that sucker. <laughs> um, the line that I think uh, began to change um, in the way we got first of all involved in, uh, I think there were two lines that were drawn. One was Watergate. The other one was the changing attitudes about the place of women in society. There was a time in American politics when the good old guys could get away with whatever they wanted to if it involved sex and women, girlfriends and mistresses, and kind of having their way, and everyone would look the other way. Gary Hart was the most dramatic example of how those rules changed, and I think appropriately so. In Gary Hart's case, for example, uh, many of his closest friends and campaign advisors had said to him, I'm not going to come onto this campaign if you're going to conduct your 
personal behavior in the way that you have in the past. And he assured them and said to us, that's no longer true, you can follow me around. So I do think that it was, I do think it was a relevant issue there. Was it blown out of proportion? Perhaps. He very bitterly felt that the press set out simply to assassinate him on that issue and that the country didn't care about it. Well, I think the country, at least under those circumstances, deserved to know something about it. What I think the problem is now is that we pronounce, that is the people in my business collectively, people who want to step into the public arena are pronounced guilty just for even looking at the possibility that they may run for public office and all manner of rumor and innuendo are allowed to float up and to get onto the airwaves early in the news cycle and kind of take form and shape. And by the mid part of the day, they seem to have some factual basis when in fact that they don't because there's such an enormous yawning appetite out there for this kind of material now. Is this hurting the quality of the candidates, the, the people who decide that they want to expose their lives to this sort of scrutiny? Not yet, but eventually. Oh, I think it already has. You think it has? I, think, I believe. You know, a lot of good people who have decided not yeah, to. Yeah, I think people say, why, why in the hell would I want to do this? I mean, they're going to they're gonna turn over. I mean, Alan Simpson is a very good example. We all know him. He didn't run for president, I believe, because he had some infractions when he was a young man and raising hell out in Wyoming. And, uh, you know, there were probably a couple of, I don't know all the details, but there were probably a couple of bar fights or a couple of rests for something. And he just didn't want that to be dredged up and put on the record as he was running for president of the United States and embarrass himself and his family and his kids. I mean, I just, I think that there are a lot of people who just don't go there anymore because they say it's not worth it. Do you disagree with that, Governor? I'm not sure it chases a lot of people away. I, I assume it chases some people away, but some people have been chased away for 200 years because they don't want to give up any of their privacy. Uh, in New York, we introduced in 1975 under Hugh Carey the first disclosure requirements in the state's history. And it cost us people like Felix Roden, uh, who uh, was a brilliant fellow, worked with Carey, worked for, with me, and still helping government. But he didn't want to file a disclosure statement. And the reason he didn't want to do it is he did have wealth, and he had children. And he was afraid to lay out the wealth in a form that might tempt some nut to, uh, to grab one of the kids, which is what he thought about. So you've been losing people for, for uh, the price one pays in making oneself public. Um, I'm not sure we, uh, we're losing a lot of people. I, I think there is no solution to the problem unless the country decides what, uh, what I've decided already, which is that we oughtn't to be looking for heroic figures as our leaders. Uh, there are no more heroes. You're not going to have another Moses. If you, if, if, uh, uh, there's something about the electronic communication age that makes this obvious now. The tremendous heat generated by the electronic um, uh, age is, it will melt or shatter the feet of clay of any hero you try to construct. And I think we should reach a point where we say, look, the Catholic Church is a fantastic institution, notwithstanding it had popes who had concubines, popes who were mad, Popes were, because the message of the church survives for 2,000 years. Let's choose leaders whose messages are important to us. Let's insist on heroic messages, not heroic messengers, because we're all sinners, we're all imperfect, and we don't want to get involved with that. And, and let's make up our mind. It's not that, you know, sin is irrelevant and your imperfection is irrelevant. It's, a, it's that that's not why I'm asking you to lead me. I'm not going to f make my life like your life. I want to hear what you have to say. If you have a good idea, I want, to, I want to have the benefit of it. And that's what we have to teach ourselves. That's the way it comes out anyway. That's the way it was with Washington and Jefferson and all these great leaders. We didn't know about Jefferson, and we didn't care, those Americans who lived then. Nor should we have. Jefferson was a great person, whatever we discover about his personal life, because of the things he said, the things... I remember Marius writing a new book on Thomas More. I didn't know at the time he was on the stage as I was giving a commencement at Harvard a few years ago. And I said, I don't like this book about Thomas More that just came out because they say he whipped heretics. You know, I don't care about Joe DiMaggio and Marilyn Monroe. You know, I don't want to hear about that stuff. DiMaggio is a great baseball player, and that, that, that's good enough for me. 
Uh, Thomas More gave up his life for a principle that's good enough for me. I don't want to hear about the imperfections. There are instructions I get from my leaders, and that's what I want. I don't want to measure them as human beings. I'll leave that up to God. When the public concludes that, then the problem goes away. Uh, because You're not going to make rules that say, don't look into a person's background. The media will stop doing it when the media concludes that the public says, we're not interested in that. We're interested in what your ideas are, for a tax cut or against it. You know, what do you do about the euro? You know, how do we deal with Kosovo? How do you deal with 44.3 million people who need health care? Don't talk to me about your girlfriends. I couldn't care less. I mean, that, that's where we should be, I think. We're not there, and we're not going to get there. The I spent the scariest year of my professional career covering Bill Clinton for the New York Times. <laughs> because I was covering a guy who every single day something new. This is not going to be personal this year. <laughs> <laughs> I would have committed that a long time ago, or kept it to myself a long time ago. But um, no, every day there was something new about this guy. There, there was just things being peeled back, and a lot of them had to do about women. And before any of us had signed up to cover Bill Clinton, a lot of us had heard the rumors about it. At the New York Times, however, we were very, very reluctant to write it. In fact, even as the Jennifer Flower story was exploding day after day, we always, I was always instructed to write a brief, three or four paragraphs, and they would put it without a byline down at the bottom of an inside page somewhere. And that was the Times saying it was going to set the standard for what the story should be. Well, the story got away from us because, in fact, not, we, we now know that all the things that we were above covering at the time turned out to be scandalous in the true sense of the word several years later. The second scariest time in my career was working for NBC News the weekend that, uh, that Bob Livingston, who was about to be Speaker of the House, quit. <laughs> Tom remembers being on the other side of, of my IFB when he was speaking and suddenly said, um, and therefore, we had just found out, of course, there were rumors about Bob Livingston's, you know, having done many things, which it turns out Newt Gingrich was also doing, but that's another story. <laughs> but, um, and Tom said to me, came to me and said, so, uh, Gwen, do we know anything about this? <laughs> and I said, no, I wouldn't have kept it to myself. It was terrible, because things were coming out everywhere. And at that point, and you'll remember, it was about a year ago, it felt like everything was toppling, that one thing after the other was going to fall. There were rumors of a Larry Flint expose of members of Congress. We, it was one of these things where, as reporters, we don't want to break it, but we didn't want to be surprised by it either. So that's where the little line that keeps shifting is really problematical for those of us in the media, because we, no, we never know when it's going to be a big deal. And just in case, we have to report it. And just in case, we dirty ourselves while we're reporting it. So it's, we are great naval gazers, we in, in the press. We spend a lot of time you know, to, renting our vests and trying to decide, is this the right way to do this? Did we do the right thing? And ultimately, we just let it play out and then try it again the next time. And the, the secret is not to fight the last war. It's not going to happen the same way the next time it happened last time. And we just have to keep looking. I, I, Roger, I'd just like to add um, kind of two PSs to what Gwen and, and what the governor have said. Um, I think that Gwen is absolutely right. We report less than people realize about things that we know. And the governor, the part of the problem is that a lot of contemporary politicians have as their message yeah. <laughs> that I'm the perfect family man. Well. And that this, is, that, that this is who I am, and I endorse all of these moral values. Newt Gingrich is our most recent example of that. Uh, here's a man who went after the president and talked about family values, and we're superior in all of that. And look what we now know about Newt Gingrich. That becomes reportable, it seems to me, when they put their family forward and put that kind of uh, matrimonial uh, loyalty forward. If they say, I'm not a perfect person, I've made mistakes, my wife understands that, that's between us, that's different. Of course, that's what Bill Clinton said yeah, on 60 yeah, Minutes yeah. in 1992. No, again, <laughs> again and again, right. No, I, I, well, that I, I agreed to. My father had two bolognese. We had to store it. We had good bologna and we had very cheap bologna. We really did. And, <laughs> and when, they asked, when they asked for the cheap bologna, we gave it to them. <laughs> So I, I, I think you, if you ask for it, you should get it. Yeah. And, and, uh, <laughs> and, 
and, and if the politician is going to be arrogant enough to suggest, yeah. I, because you, you have to be awfully Follow dumb. me around. You right. have to be, all, well, even if you don't say, you have to be awfully arrogant as a human being to stand up and say, I'm a good person. Right. And, and you, you model yourself after me. I, I don't know anybody that good. Uh, you'd have, so if they're, that by itself should disqualify them from leadership, really. <laughs> If that's the way they make the case. But you talked about but they're heroic messages. Are they? are they doing that now? Does anybody do it now? Doing what? You know, holding themselves out as a good family person. Well, they're doing it a lot less than they were a year ago. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that they are. I think if you, uh, certainly if you, look at the, uh, if you look at the Republican <laughs> candidates that will be there tomorrow night, that's a big part of the Steve Forbes message that he puts out there to contrast himself with... Uh, John McCain, and also going after the, you know, the refusal of George W. Bush to talk about possible indiscretions in his youth. Uh, Steve Forbes keeps reinforcing uh, his, what he says is his upstanding personal character and his uh, long marriage to his wife and all that he's been as a, not just as a public uh, citizen, but as a private citizen as well. He's put it out there. Is there a heroic message you want to hear? Here I ask Gwen and Tom as citizens more than uh, as reporters, um, if it's not the person standing and say, look at me in my perfection, what are we looking for in candidates? What you, is, is it the individual issue, issue by issue by issue, or is there something grander that we still expect even though it's not expressed? I know you're going to be surprised by this, but I honestly believe that it's, a, it's, it's the extreme version of this. But Jesse Ventura is not an accident in Minnesota, and that there are lots of states in this country where someone like Jesse Ventura who would come along and say, I don't have all the answers, I want to, I want to do it in an unconventional way, will do well. He ran against two very pedigreed politicians out there who, if you look at conventional wisdom, should have put him away. Right. And the fact of the matter is that in Minnesota where they take their politics very seriously, this is the home after all Gene McCarthy and Hubert Humphrey and Orville Freeman, and they've, you know, they've got a long tradition of politics. Jesse Ventura not only prevailed there, but now his approval rating is up again, and it's because he's breaking the bonds of kind of politics as usual, saying we can't have a fusion government. Uh, I don't have all the answers. He's made terrible mistakes along the way. There's no question about that. My own concern about him is that he'll become far too hubristic. He's now beginning to believe in himself <laughs> in, in too much. But, uh, yeah, always a dangerous thing. But I think, I think what people are looking for is someone coming along not so filled with moral certainty and with, and with kind of political authority and promising solutions. I can deliver all this. You know, some people are saying, I'm, I'm not sure I do have all the answers. But specifically, as a voter, what will you be looking for in a candidate? What will I be looking mm -hmm. for? Not as a journalist. But I, as a I'm always looking for someone who's willing to risk political capital and personal capital to try to do that which is hard that is for all of society. Uh, take the issue of race, which is the continuing uh, passion that I believe that, uh, that we have not resolved. I'm looking for a candidate who's willing to go out there, spend some capital on that in a personal and political way to say we're going to get to a better place in America on the issue of race. And it probably is going to cost me along the way, but I think I can help us do that. I, I, what do you mean by that? Are oh, you talking about what the candidate, you can, oh, you can personally help us do that, or the candidate can help no, us I, do but that? No, I'm, I'm looking for a candidate who is willing to say that I am willing to spend ah. political and personal capital on an issue. In this case, it would be race, but I think that there are other issues as well. And I think that... Oh. What we've got now, or in, I think that the, the governor identifies this, and when he talks about the pervasive role of the electronic media in all of our forms, and you get kind of push-button candidates. Mm -hmm. You know, you hit the remote button, you get one message out of them. You hit another remote button, you get another message out of them because they're playing only to the demigod of uh, the electronic message. Well, I agree with you. I think we're all looking for, as individuals, I have, have a hard time separating myself out from my reporting because I just knee jerk. I've done that for so long. But we're but all looking. But you'll step into a voting booth as a citizen, I'm not as a reporter. looking for the same thing that I think most citizens are looking for, which is authenticity, which is a different version of what Tom is talking for because I think often talking about, I think authenticity is what is, it's one of those things where you know it when you see it. It's as you define it. 
ought, someone can, for instance, come out and speak very eloquently about race and really catch my ear and catch my attention. But the, often, the authenticity I'm searching for is whether you're then going to do something about it. Bill Clinton speaks eloquently about race, but his race commission was a terrible failure. Um, I don't know what that means. Does that mean I want someone who's willing to talk about it, perhaps? Does that mean I want someone who's willing to speak in a way that rings a bell with me? I think that's what we're all looking for. That's, that's why Jesse Ventura worked for people, because he cut through some sort of fog. And that's what I'm looking for. But I don't know, I, I could not point at a candidate at this stage, of course it's early, but I couldn't point at someone and say that's the person who's doing it for me, or that that person is doing it for me in rhetoric, but can actually do something about it once he or she is elected. And I, um, you know, I kind of have, I think it's one, one of the reasons why reporters have fallen in love so much with John McCain. He seems like he's so, he was here last week, right? Mm -hmm. He seems like he's so, you know, he's right out there, he'll tell you what he thinks. He's, he has these rolling press conferences on his buses in New Hampshire where reporters are looking for ways to get off. Um, <laughs> he, he has press conferences and they say, oh, that's okay, I can get him later on the phone. I mean, he is so accessible, but, but, and because he seems authentic to people. Now, I'm not certain whether that's real or not, but that's kind of what we're all searching for. Governor? Yeah, I, I think um, I would agree with the, both Gwen and Tom. The, uh, I, I, I think the Ventura situation is very revealing. So was Perot, 18, 19% of the vote. I mean, the president got, what, 42, 43? And 43 percent of the vote and you're elected and Perot got uh, about half what you got a little bit less and that means something and if you consider all the people who don't vote as a vote you know they are these are people who are saying I don't believe the Democrats I don't believe the Republicans I don't believe the conservatives I don't believe the liberals I'm not showing up a lot of them so the the strongest vote in this country the strongest expression of opinion is I don't believe you guys um, and so, and I think the, the purely rational approach to it would be to say, look, I'm not a conservative or a liberal. Forget those labels. Those labels are pretentious. They presume to say, you can judge my position on a whole series of issues by my label conservative. And that's ridiculous. Uh, I'm a liberal, says Bill Clinton in 1992, and winds up saying the era of big government is over. Big government, you mean Social Security, Medicare, the, the Resolution Trust Corporation, Eisenhower's road program, the IMF, the world, but this is big government. What are you talking about? So what we should do is to say, forget the label, we're gonna do it an issue at a time. That's Ventura. Yeah. Uh, and, and the big question is, what is the role of government, big government, little government? Forget about it. Housing, can you do housing in Manhattan without government? No because it would be all luxury housing. Education, uh, can, you do, uh, can you do education without government? Well, they did for 100 years. Uh, um, they had private schools only, it didn't work. With 90% of the students in public schools, no, you can't go to a private school, so you need public. Okay, we'll take it an issue at a time, and I'll argue with you on the issues. That, that's what I'd want my politician to say. Now they're captured by the party system. But they're getting close to what I'm saying. That's what compassionate conservatism is. That's a shorthand way of saying forget the party platform. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a lot of baloney. I'm a conservative, I'm also a compassionate. Okay, I, I said at Yale in 1985, they asked me, what's the big thing you'd change? I said, the language. Semantics are killing us. I said, I'm gonna run as a progressive pragmatist. <laughs> and, and, and they said, and, and when you ask what is a progressive pragmatist, I'm gonna say, well, let me govern and I'll show you. And then I'll govern for four years and each decision will be a decision dot. And then you'll join them together and it'll create a figure. And you say, oh, now we got them. This is what a progressive pragmatist is. But for my second term, I'm gonna announce I'm a neo-progressive pragmatist. <laughs> because I don't want you making that judgment on me. You know, tell me about the issue and, and I'll give you the answer. That's what I would want uh, from the politician in approach. And the answer I would want from the politician, the platform I would want from that politician this year from Gore or Bradley, uh, presumably, because that's where I want to be is within the democratic context. The answer I, I would want to hear from him is, look, here's, here's what I think the game is about. I think the country's stronger than it ever was. If you're in the stock market, if you're a formidable investor, 
if you're an entrepreneur or a high-skilled worker. For everybody else, it's not so high. For the unskilled workers, the moderate skilled workers, that's 130 million of them, they're going nowhere. Now, I know that. For the people who don't have health insurance, 44.3 million, they're going nowhere. For old people, a lot of them need prescription drugs and more. So there are a lot of people left out. Now, game is, can we keep everything that's good now in the stock market and all the prosperity? Can we keep that and do something about the rest? My objective is to do that, and I think you can. I will not raise your taxes. I will not add officious regulation. And I will not run a deficit. I swear to you, I spent eight years with Clinton fighting that. That's where I am. No deficit, no tax increase. And still, I'm going to find ways to make the weak people stronger without making the strong people weaker. And, you know, some help for health insurance. It's a little more with that. Now, and, and I think, you know, that's, that's close to where Clinton's speeches are. Now all you need is a little, a, a, a little substance. Bill, <laughs> Bill, Bradley has, uh, Bill Bradley has started. He's pushed the Democrats by giving you a number. Now we're, we're tending to dismiss it. But I wouldn't dismiss it so fast if I were Gore. I'd say, right now, Bradley wants to spend $60 billion, But he's dealing with 44.3 million uninsured people. We came up with Child Health Plus in New York, and the federal government adopted that. That was my program, Child Health Plus. But there are ways to deal with it. But that's what I would want to hear. You know, the truth, the, the cold truth, that what's happening is some politicians are pretending everything's great so we can give back 800 billion bucks because we don't need the money. That's the Republicans. The Democrats are saying, well, everything's great, but, uh, you know, it could be better. They'll admit it could be better, but they're not doing enough to make it better. I would like a guy who says, I'm not a Democrat, I'm not a, a liberal, and I'm not a Republican, I'm not a conservative. I'm just telling you, here's where we are, here's what I want to do. That's what I'd look for in a politician, and we're getting there. And Ventura and Perot and the people who are not voting, they're all pushing you in that direction. Governor, listening to you up here on this stage, I'm reminded again of the enduring question that all political reporters have. In the early winter of 1992, the plane was on the runway, ready to lift off new, for New Hampshire, and a filing date was closing in, and you stayed behind in Albany. Do you ever regret that? Um, regret, no. I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't have a choice. The, um, now I don't know why this escaped the, the whole world of media, but... What happened, what, and, and it really didn't, it's to me an extraordinary thing. I've talked to uh, some people about it, including Tim Russett, who I knew a little bit about before he was um, a star at NBC. Uh, in 19, I guess it was 91, wasn't it? In 90, in, uh, yeah, the New Hampshire day, so it was 91. I had never, never even considered the presidency until a fundraiser in late 1991, a group of my people said, and Matilda was at the fundraiser. It was my regular group who came from Queens, a lot of them, and who had been giving me money for 20 years, most of them Republicans, frankly, uh, because those were the people I was brought up with. And uh, they said, this guy, Vincent Albanese from Queens County, said, Mario, is it true that you and Matilda have never talked about the presidency? And uh, I said, well, ask Matilda. And Matilda says, never. It's never brought it up. It's never been discussed. I said, are you kidding? This was 91. I'd been uh, leading in the polls in 91 and 88, and... And he said, no, we never did. He, uh, why? Well, I don't know. Ask Mario. And I said, because we worked on the governorship. I told Dukakis in 88, he should be the candidate. He came to see me. He said, will you run? I said, uh, well, are you going to run? He says, I want to. I said, then you run. You can't have two ethnic governors from the Northeast running. Um, <laughs> you're the head of the NGA, the NGA. You've been a governor longer than I. You're more qualified than I. You run. That's it. And that was that. 91, I said, after that, after that press, after that party we had in the morning, I said, I will take a look at it and announced it that day. And we spent two months taking a look at it. And then I came back after two months and said in a press conference, uh, just before Ron Brown's date, which was the November filing date, I said, look, I, everything indicates that I can make a plausible run and I will do it if I can make a budget with the Republicans, which I thought they would make. One house was Republican, led by Ralph Marino at the time, and it's been Republican for 60 years. And I had heard from Novak writing columns saying there were no Marios down south, 
and the, the word coming back from Washington that George Bush thought the easiest person to beat would be somebody like a Mario Cuomo, whose name sounds like a symphony. Imagine what you could do with that, you know. Uh, and and uh, so I thought they'd make a budget. They refused to make a budget. I gave them until the day of the filing date, which is the plane on the tarmac. I did not know, Tom, there was a plane on the tarmac. John Marino did, in fact, have a plane on the tarmac. He was running the thing, but I didn't know it was there. Uh, I had told him, look, I'm going to go to the last moment asking Marino if he will make a budget. I came, had a press conference, I said, the man says he's not going to make a budget if I run for president. I can't run for president because I'd be in Illinois talking about the economy and the New York Times would be running a headline saying New York economy goes down the tubes. But you don't regret that? Do I regret that? If I <laughs> regret, I'm afraid to say regret, Gwen. I, I was so lucky in my life, you know, three three governorships that said, I've had so much good luck, I'm, and I'm getting older now, and I'm getting close to accountability. You know, I believe in that stuff. <laughs> and I don't want to be in a position where whoever is keeping score thinks I'm ungrateful that, that I had so many good things. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not going to say, uh, even, I'll be honest with you, even if I regretted it, I wouldn't say <laughs> I regret it. <laughs> we are picking up on that. <laughs> what about the Supreme Court? Supreme Court was easy. Supreme Court, uh, well, it wasn't easy. I mean, the Supreme Court was the most natural ambition for me personally, because I've always been more a lawyer than anything else. I'm a much better lawyer than anything else I've ever done, and I love the law. And uh, the president knew that, and the idea, if, I had, if it had not been for my political experience, the idea of being a justice of the Supreme Court, well, there is nothing that would even come close to it. The idea that all you have to do is, is to sit and listen to arguments on important subjects and study and then discuss them with your colleagues and then write an opinion and with your decision to waft it out there and if they like it, they like it, and if they don't, I'm here. <laughs> you know. I mean, the idea that you don't even have to buy a pair of pants, actually. They give you a robe, you know. <laughs> the, uh, there aren't many things more, but what you give up, and, and when it came to me, when the opportunity came to me, what would you, you would have to give up is the chance ever to speak again on any of the other important issues. You can't say anything about the poverty question. You can't talk about 44.3 million people who don't have health insurance. You can't talk about all the things you learned as a governor, all the real problems in this country. The real problems are not constitutional. I mean, constitutional problems, of course, when they arise, need to be dealt with. You have only 75 cases a year. Of the 75 cases, maybe two or three are really big cases. I would have been a dissenter, probably, in some of those cases. And, and that's, it's not that that's not a worthy thing, but if you put that against, well, how about just spending the rest of your time, even if you're not in public service, out there getting on a stage with important people like, like you, frankly, and being able to throw in my shot here and there, debating around the country, doing what I can do. I feel, frankly, personally, better doing that than I would in terms of, you know, public service as a, as a justice of the Supreme Court. This obviously is not to diminish the importance of the court, it's just that I wouldn't have been able to do much for that court. Now, maybe I can't do much on the other issues, but at least, you know, I'm free to share my experiences of 20 years, which you couldn't do as a judge. You're not allowed to speak on these subjects. But, but no regret. If I, if I did make a mistake, it was not listening to Andrew, who in 1990 said, don't run again for governor. Mm. Um, he says, there's a recession, the, country, the, company, the state's going to be in tough shape. Skip this, let's look at the national. And I said, Andrew, how can we do that? You know, I had eight great years, now the state is in trouble, and is going to be in trouble, and now I quit as governor. I said, that doesn't sound right. I don't feel right about that. So I agreed to run. Being governor made it more difficult to run for president. These are questions from the audience. These questions are always good, and it takes us in, a, in this one, first one, in a historical direction. It says, what three political events of the century caused the greatest social change, asked of all of us? It doesn't have to be three, it can be one or two, but is there something that stays in your minds as um, uh, a pivotal uh, event, political event, um, that you saw uh, change the country most? The pivotal event in my lifetime was, were assassinations, always. Um, I grew up, I was born in Queens, Flushing, Queens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you, thank you. 
I grew up with the, the daughter of uh, immigrant parents from the West Indies. My father was a preacher, and they felt very, very strongly about this country. And so therefore, I came, probably came to be a reporter because we were always put in front of the television set, or I think I used to watch Tom as a small child. Um, <laughs> Mario and I did as well. <laughs> Anyway, these things were very real for us, what was happening. When I came home and saw my big father crying when John F. Kennedy was killed, that, that changed my life. When we were awakened from our sleep to, to hear about Bobby Kennedy, that changed our lives. When Martin Luther King was killed, that changed our lives. And all of that, I think, propelled my thinking about politics and politicians and government. I think it shaped this country in ways that politics has something to do with, but not a lot to do, not everything to do with. And I think that those if you survive, I talk to people now who are, I call them kids, but it turns out they're actual grown-ups who didn't live through any of this. And they just have a different world view. It's an altered world view, um, and, but it's an altered world view that starts from where mine left off. And it's really very interesting, but as a result, you can vote for Jesse Ventura because you don't think the same thing about the, the, the casting of the vote as I do. For me, I worked for a boss once at a newspaper who thought that reporters shouldn't vote. And I thought, well, and which one of your you know, relatives was hosed in order to get the right to vote? To me, it was very important. And these are the things that shaped my thinking, and these are the things that shape kind of my stubborn belief that, that government and, and politics can still matter. Tom, any political events stick out in your mind? Well, I think of World War II as a political event. <laughs> you know, it was a decision to get involved in it, obviously. I think it was the defining event of the 20th century for all the reasons that everyone in this room certainly is familiar with. And I think that it shaped the world that we have today. If The very simple test is if we had not gotten involved, if Roosevelt didn't have the courage to do what he did, to position us to get involved, and then to do all that we did after, immediately after, this would be a far different world today than, uh, than we would care to live in, quite honestly. So, and I've been immersed in it, obviously, because of these books that I've been writing about that generation. After that, I agree with Gwen. I, I remember the day I was working as a reporter in Omaha, and I was racing out to the Strategic Air Command headquarters because we didn't know what was going on when, when John F. Kennedy had been shot. And I'd grown up in the innocence of the 50s, and I kept thinking to myself, my God, this does not happen in our society. And I did actually at that time have a thought that this is going to change us in some way. And I don't know how, but it's going to change us in some fashion. So I think first the war and then the beginning of those assassinations and how it altered uh, our attitudes culturally and politically uh, really did have a profound effect. Mary? I, I agree. I, I read the book, and it's a, it's a very important book. And, and uh, I enjoyed your book particularly because in every speech I've given in the last five years, I make the point that we, we uh, almost every speech, we don't have anything, uh, we don't have a heroic figure to gather around. We don't have any single great idea. And the last time I remember this country in my lifetime believing in something that fused us, it was the Second World War. That was a really big idea. We were good, they were evil, we were fighting for freedom, they were trying to destroy it. And, and seeing the, the world, uh, the United States in the Second World War, uh, we've never seen it that way since. And the incredible power that this country was able to generate when it saw itself uh, as all believing in one uplifting and noble notion. And that's what we should be striving for again. I think the second, I, I would tack on now because my favorite idea is this notion of tikkun olam. It really is. That's what our politics ought to be about. How do we make the place better? How do we repair this universe? That is ultimately the political objective. The, the, the coming together of the European Union, I think, will eventually be seen as a great political event because while here in this country, a lot of the politics is trying to fragment us, states' rights. Now, I, I'm responsible for one of the great states' rights decisions, as a, frankly, it, it doesn't get a lot of publicity, but we beat the federal government in a case for state of New York involving low-level radioactive waste. And I, as a governor, I made my states' rights argument. But the idea of fragmenting the power in this country by taking it from the national government and sending it down the states is exactly the opposite of what Europe is doing which is taking 370 million people, taking all their governments and fusing it into one. 
because they know that their interconnectedness and interdependence, tighter wound, will make them an incredibly formidable force against us and against the East, the, the two economies that they will be competing with. But, but the lesson in that, too, is that, hey, look, the way you're coming together, 370 million, imagine if we could put the planet together. Imagine if, and now obviously it's not going to happen in, in our generation, or maybe not the next one, but that ought to be the direction, that you bring this place together as one world. I mean, there is nothing uh, histrionic about that. There's nothing excessive about that. That's pure logic. That's where the whole universe is going. It's growing from the slime to the sublime by integration. That's the direction of the world, and, and uh, that's what the European uh, Union is going to represent, and that's what the Second World War was all about. We go from a macro question to a micro question. I don't know why this appeals to me, but would you send the little boy back to Cuba? <laughs> Since it ramifies to something else, would you send the little boy back to Cuba? Absolutely. It's a custody issue. I mean, it's, it's, it, if, if for some reason the father, I just can't imagine another case where a blood relative, the blood parent, would be challenged in any way. Now, the reason why the administration is tiptoeing around this is because there are, a lot, there are loads and loads of political you know, problems here for them. But in the end, and they're going to do this, in the end they're going to find a, a discreet way out of this. They're going to find a way to say, well, you know, <laughs> If we had anything, if we could, we could do anything about it, we'd keep him here. And the whole idea of freedom, he's six years old. What does he get to say? His parent gets to say. Anybody else? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Gwen. I, the, I, I would agree. I, I, I'd like to qualify it a little bit. It should be decided the way you decide custody matters generally. I mean, the rule is <clears throat> custody, and you don't have to be a lawyer to, to understand this. The, uh, important consideration is the child. What is best for the child? And um, it's normally done under state law. So it would be Florida law, and it should be handled that way. And the inquiry should be, what is the best thing for the child? My instinct would be, without knowing any other fact, that the natural father has the dominant right. I mean, obviously. Uh, but that, that could be altered by the facts. A curious thing, you know, if you ask yourself, what would have happened if this were a Chinese mm -hmm. child? Right. Exactly. You know, if it, and, and the truth is that that dramatizes this absurd contradiction in policy between the way we deal with China and the way we deal with Cuba. You know, Cuba is such a horrid place, so easy to manipulate politically by us that we, we build this artificial wall and every chance we have to make the point, we, we use it. If this were a Chinese child, it wouldn't even be a discussion. It would, the, the child would be on his way back now. The, uh, the other... Well, I've been thinking about this because I'm, I've got the Republicans tomorrow night in Iowa. I invite you to watch on MSNBC once more. Uh, and sort of, but, I'm, but I'm struck by, on the Republican side, especially the advocates of the family is primary in our lives, except in this case, the state becomes primary in our lives. <laughs> Secondly, that was, a, that was a mother, obviously, who was determined to have freedom for herself. But think of the peril in which she put this child two days on an inner tube, you know, in the Caribbean, and the father is back there with both sets of grandparents saying they had no idea that she was going to do that. So it's, it makes wonderful political fodder uh, and noise at the highest levels, but it is kind of ripe with hypocrisy, it seems to me. Do you think that the media adds to and enhances the current mean-spiritedness in politics? I think we add to, and, uh, and, and let me describe for you, and I think I can speak for Gwen on this, uh, the dilemma that those of us have in what you would describe as the traditional or mainstream media, is that this spectrum has been broadened beyond our wildest expectations of anything that we could have anticipated. Between all talk radio, 24 hour day cable news, uh, one cable channel with a real political agenda now attached to it, uh, um, you have the tabloids in a war here in New York, obviously, uh, one going after another, another one there with a real political agenda. So those of us who have kind of always represented what you may even describe as the soporific media, the, that, that is that we're trying to do things in a traditional, conventional, i.e. what we think is a responsible fashion, are surrounded by this cacophony on all sides of us. And when you're out there, 
absorbing all of that, it's, it's sometimes hard to distinguish between these voices. But what has happened is that we do then have a kind of journalistic culture of gotcha. Uh, everyone trying to make a quick score uh, for the next news cycle, to create a buzz of some kind, and makes it damn tough for someone like Gwen, who was covering Congress for her, and I'm on the phone to her saying, what about this? <laughs> you know, reading it on the wires or hearing it from somewhere else, to try to say to me, back off, Tom, take a breath. This is the real story. We're going to try to get this done because there are all these competitive things going on in the environment. So I do think that the bottom line is that it has gotten worse. I do think that, the, that we've gotten better at it in the last few years. I think that the, I think the worst race that I can remember in my memory was Dukakis against George Bush and all that went on and how that was covered. And George Bush got away with a lot that uh, we learned from. Is the competitiveness driven by money? When, you, when Tom says, what about this Gwen? Is that a traceable question to somebody well, saying? Well, everything driven by money really in life? Not necessarily. Well, a lot of things. I, I, I don't know. I don't, I, I actually w would separate it out. I, th I think the competitiveness, competitiveness is just driven by the competitiveness. Maybe at some level beyond, there are people up in the great skyscraper somewhere who are counting the dollars and cents and the ratings. But I think at the, the level where this is being driven, especially say on the internet, which the governor alluded to earlier, this is something which is racing along, and it doesn't really have a lot to do with some with Matt Drudge isn't thinking, like, how am I going to you know make money for Fox News Channel uh, by holding up? I think he wanted to hold up a baby fetus in the air, and they fired him. Right. Um, that wasn't about him trying. That was just about him trying to make, cause some trouble, which he's really good at doing. And I think that's doing more to push us in all these interesting directions than any kind of great profit motive. It was, Roger, it was just as hotly competitive when they were really only CBS and NBC going after each other in the political arena. I mean, they were, you know, we were at each other's throats every day. But with people counting the, uh, the size of an audience per second or per half second, and somebody, not necessarily yourselves, but somebody wondering whether or not he or she can retain a job as a result of the size of the audience, isn't there ultimately some traceable line to um, a bottom line? It's always been true. I mean, before there was television, before there was radio, you had all those newspapers in the city, and it was all a circulation war. And it was what headline they could get, what, what salacious fact that they could disclose before anybody else. Um, does it drive it now? Uh, sure, to some degree it does. It's a lot about survivability. But I think that uh, it's overstated. I think Gwen is right in that case. I also think that it's driving it in ways that don't have to do with competition over you know, tawdry detail that the extent that the audience we're going after is, is dictating the kind of news we, want, we present to you might mean that we're doing a better job in telling the story that viewers want to hear. I think that ne the networks in general are doing a better job of, for instance, explaining women's issues to women viewers because that's who's watching. And that's, you know, I don't know if it's, it's cart pulling the horse or not, but there are certain, you know, economic imperatives that, that, that drives that. And as a result, you're actually getting more coverage of an undercovered, what has previously been undercovered. I, I get the feeling that economic um, motivations drive the whole larger idea of what you cover and how you cover it, but not the day-to-day the -day competitive nitpicking. To go from the, some of the grimmer concerns or the more um, uh, worried concerns that we've talked about to something a little happier and more sublime, in the experience of the two journalists, um, can you recall a moment in politics where you sat back and said, well, that was, that was quite wonderful. That was something worth a life, that I'm glad I do this, and I was glad I was present at this. Well, I can remember many of those moments, and it's not just because he's on the stage, but the most electrifying, one of the most electrifying speeches I've ever heard was given by this man in San Francisco, San Francisco. the Democratic National Convention. Um, I'm happy to say... <laughs> I'm happy to say that uh, I'm happy to say that he ended up in the NBC booth immediately afterwards. Uh, <laughs> Dragged there by his tie. Oh, you should know that the man who delivered him to that booth was Timothy Russert, who has had a long and illustrious career with NBC ever since he delivered it to us. Uh, I can remember other occasions as well. I think that uh, Gerald Ford looking out into the television uh, camera and saying, "Our long national nightmare is over." This simple man from 
Michigan that a lot of people, I think, had underestimated about how he could heal the country just by his fundamental decency was uh, something. Um, for me, the most exciting and most painful year in American politics was 1968. I thought that Gene McCarthy, for whom I don't have a lot of personal regard because I think he's essentially a mean-spirited guy uh, and petty in a lot of his personal proclamations, did a courageous thing by going off to New Hampshire and taking on Lyndon Johnson. And then I think that Bobby Kennedy was the most electrifying uh, candidate I ever saw on the stump. Uh, I thought that he had, a, he had an enormous impact on American politics and the way he conducted himself at that time. For you, Gwen, an exhilarating moment? Um, in 1993, when I was covering the White House for the New York Times, and Tom knows covering the White House is, is in some ways not all it's cracked up to be. In other ways, provides a series of really moments that, that, that sear yourself, sear in your mind, because there's nothing more fun than being able to sit on the front row and force the President of the United States to answer your questions. But the moment that I, that I remember was standing on the South Lawn and, and watching the, the Israeli-Palestinian peace agreement and the handshake. And I, there was literally a chill that went through. There must have been 500 people that went through. Everybody was hushed. And it was a moment that you just carry with you. I, I can't explain what it was. It was like everyone thought they saw something cracking open. And it, it was an amazing moment. I remember going over right after that moment to interview uh, Itzhak Rabin, and I said, he had a drink in his hand, and he was sitting back with that wonderful doer expression that he often had on his face. And uh, I said, with all due respect, Mr. Prime Minister, you didn't look very comfortable. He said, that would not be the wrong assumption on your part. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to phrase the question a little differently for you, Governor, because you're going to wind it up for us this evening. Um, can you think of a moment where you said to yourself, at least one moment where you said to yourself, why did I get in this in the first place? <laughs> and then can you think of another, and this is really where the emphasis lies, where you thought, this is why? Hmm. The first question is easier than the second one. <laughs> the, uh, oh, yeah, sure, there are, there are plenty, plenty of moments. I, I, I would divide the experience uh, between political campaigns and political activity and governance. And, you know, the political part of it is lousy. I mean, starting with having to beg for money. You know, every time you're out there and, and you realize that money is, is relevant, you're, you're, you're disgusted. And, and so that part of it was, I, I hated uh, every part of that. Um, the governance part is, is often very, very beautiful. Um, I think the, the, both moments occurred for me twice in, in the same episode. One was 1983, Ossining, eight days after I was elected governor. I was, at the, as, uh, I was at Madison Square Garden with Andrew and Christopher and Matilda watching Georgetown St. John's and um, got a call that they had snatched 16 guards at Ossining and uh, were holding them and threatening to kill them. And state police said, this is eight days now after being governor. I said, well, I'm going to Austin, Sing Sing. And, and then a cop, actually, one of the state policemen said, no, the, you don't want to do that, governor. You ought to check with your people. You don't want to go to Austin because the governor shouldn't be there at the location. And I was thinking of Attica and Rockefeller wasn't there. And naively, I wanted to go. So I made a decision to set up a command post at the World Trade Center, which we did for 57 hours. We had an open line, and we talked to the superintendent of uh, corrections and to the superintendent of the institution, and we negotiated. At one stage, the voice came over the phone that said, the inmates have demanded that you grant amnesty to them, and you tell them that there's amnesty or they're sending out the testicles of the first guard on a plate in five minutes, and you have five minutes from the time they told me, which was about three and a half minutes left, maybe four. Uh, and uh, that was a moment when, you know, I said to myself, you know, what am I doing here? We went right down to the end of that period. I asked the people in the room, what do you think? What would you do? What you do? One guy said, look, tell them that you'll give them amnesty, and then we'll screw them later. And I said, you can't do that, because then we'll have no credibility at all. You know, this is the beginning of my governorship. That'll be all through the prison system. We can't do that. And my answer was, uh, tell them no amnesty. 
and I went into the room, the bathroom, and threw up on the 57th floor of the World Trade Center. Um, everybody was terribly tense. I don't remember. It sounded, it felt like three hours later, but maybe it was three minutes later. The voice came over and said, they've sent out another demand. And everybody you know, cheered in the room and said, thank God. So that was an occasion when both things happened in the same episode. The other was when they bombed the World Trade Center. I was on my way to the Trade Center. We had an office on the 57th floor. We had a pregnant woman in her eighth month who worked for us, who was helped down 57 flights of stairs by a guy who worked for Con Ed and one of the work. All sorts of heroic things happened. But the idea that they had tried to destroy the World Trade Center, you know, and a bomb went off. I mean, I was so sick over it. I mean, the, the first, so angry about it. This, nothing like this had ever happened. Nothing. This was a symbol of the United States of America, and I was afraid it was some nation that, you know, you were going to find some national representative who did this, and that would have been terrible because that would have gotten you to the edge of war as it developed. It wasn't a, na a national thing to the extent that we could tell. So that was a terrible moment. Uh, and then they said, we have to have a press conference. And that was an even worse moment. Because what do you say? What do you say when the obvious question is asked, which is, what do we do now, Governor? You know, this is the World Trade Center. Do you go back? Don't you go back? Do you say, I'm not going to go back until the FBI tells me this building is absolutely safe? And if they do that, and do you say that all the tenants of the World Trade Center ought not to have to go back until we're assured that it's safe? Uh, that occurred to me, but then it occurred to me that if I say that, then nobody's going to be safe. Because now they'll bomb, because they've stopped you, they've brought you to your knees. So what I said at the press conference, without, you know, script or, or having the chance to really discuss it with anybody, I said, uh, uh, I want to be the first person back into the World Trade Center. I've told the people who run the place. I've asked them how long they think it'll take to repair them, uh, repair it. This was next morning. They said three months. I said make it two months, and. Um, Stan Breshnoff was the guy who was running it, and uh, uh, I said, because we can't have the world believe we were brought to our knees by this attack. The one thing we have to make clear is you're not going to bring us down. We're going to go right back to activity. Every tenant in the World Trade Center except one agreed to come back. I also said, you know, if they want to break leases, etc., I'll consider that, but we're going to come back. Anybody who works for me is free to say they don't wish to come back, but we're going to come back. I'm going to be the first tenant in. And I was about two months later. <laughs> As a matter of fact, Stan Bresnoff, I told Stan, I said, look, I'm very serious about this. We're going to have a million cameras when I come back. This place better be perfect. We went up to my room. I opened the doors to the desk, you know, took a, the sh shelf out of it, and then looked up, and there was an air conditioning duct. And Stan Brezhnev looked at me and he said, you're not going to. I said, get me a chair. I got up, opened the grill on the duct, and put my hand in the duct and felt for that. It came out. It was absolutely clean. And the guy said to Brezhnev, all new ducts in this room. <laughs> <laughs> so, so those were two events, the, the Ostning and the World Trade Center, where you, you, you both said to yourself, what am I doing here, and, and who needs this, and who wants it? And where you said, uh, the, when at the end, it was, it was I, I thought, a, a memorable moment for me and a satisfying one, because I think that the decision on the World Trade Center proved to be right. That, that's what you should have said at that point, we're coming back. It seems easy now. It wasn't so easy at the time. Are you happy you were governor of New York State? The, the difference between, I, I, as I say, very few people have ever had the kind of good luck I've had. You know, with the family I have, the people, the parents, everything. Everything that's ever happened to me has been uh, fantastic. Um, and maybe the best thing that happened outside of uh, the kids and Matilda and, and the family is uh, being given the privilege of public service. And the difference between being governor and, and what I'm able to do now, which is so much easier and you make more money and life is, uh, is, 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 is easier in a lot of ways, what you lose is the sense of efficacy. When you're governor, you wake up in the morning, I can imagine what it is for the president, and you say to yourself, there are an infinite number of opportunities out there today to do something really important. You can help a child, or help a million children. If only you can find the way to do it, I can do something really important today as governor. And if you screw up all the opportunities, 
but you wake up the next day, they're still there. Every day there's a chance to really do something helpful, some little thing, some big thing. And, and that opportunity to be of service and to do something about tikkun olam, something real, it's very hard to match that in the private sector. Now, these people have it, too, in the media, because they can do a tremendous amount of good just by delivering the truth. You know, and and that, that gives them a sense of efficacy. But that's what I felt as governor, and I miss it. Only reason I didn't read several of these questions is they said, run, Mario. <laughs> Thank you, Gwen. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Governor. Thank you very much. Good night. Are you all right?